And while our final presenter is setting up, I'd like to introduce him. Uh, this is Joey Stanley. Um, he is a student here at the University of Georgia, and he's going to be giving us a presentation on uh, separate phonemes R, is that how you want to call it? It, 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 it depends. <laughs> so we have some issues there. Uh, uh, the court card merger in real time. So I'll let him get set up. Can you hear me? Yes. Just get a couple screens set up here. Okay, so yeah, my, my, my talk today is about the chord card merger in real time, and it's, a, it's kind of a play on IPA, because it, it's, the title talk changes whether you have the chord card merger. Am I talking about separate phonemes or merging phonemes, or is it that these separate phonemes are merging? Stay tuned to find out. Um, so in sociolinguistics, we use what's called um, the, the apparent time hypothesis which is the idea that the speech of a 40-year-old uh, directly represents the speech of a 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 years ago. Um, however, this has yet to be officially t tested, um, and it may not be quite that simple. And so my hypothesis for this talk is that individuals undergo language, language change over the course of, of their lifetime. Um, as a bit of background, uh, real-time studies are really hard to do, or rather, they're, they're really rare, um, and it's because um, it's hard, or well, there are two different kinds of real-time studies. The, the, the first kind is where you track down people from a previous study. But this is really di difficult because people move around a lot. But it has been done. Uh, some previous research have, have tracked down people in Montreal and some other places, and they found that pe the speakers generally did change their language uh, sort of in the, gen the general direction. It's a language change in the community surrounding them. The other option you have for a real-time study is to find previous recordings of the same speaker. However, it's really hard to find good quality recordings of the same speaker speaking in the same style consistently over a long period of time. As far as I know, this has happened twice. Um, the more famous one is where the researchers looked at the Queen of England's um, Christmas broadcasts and found that her language change did change, or rather her language did change uh, in the general direction of Southern British English. And so th this, my study is of this second type, and as far as I know, it's only the third of its kind. The feature that I'm concerned with is, is called the chord card merger. This uh, comes from what was once a three-way distinction in Middle English before R's, O, open O, and A. Today that distinction has uh, been reduced down to two. Most people merge these two cl classes into what's called the horse-horse merger leaving the third one separate. However, some speakers merge these two classes into what's called the chord card merger, leaving the higher one separate. This is a largely geographic feature. You can see it occurs in parts of the southeast, uh, the Midlands, including St. Louis, and parts of New England. If you've ever heard some actors or politicians or some people say, talk about maybe the horrible oranges or something like that. That's, that's sort of the feature that I'm talking about right now. The speaker for my study uh, is from Utah, though. Uh, and, and the chord card merger in Utah had a quick rise and fall. The first generation U Utahns didn't really ha have it, but it qu uh, qu quickly rose in popularity. And by the 1930s, it was reportedly complete in Salt Lake City. Um, but a few decades later, it reversed. And today, it's sort of seen as a quaint feature of the oldest generation Utahns. So now let's see what I did. Uh, the data that I used for, for, for this com comes from what's called uh, General Conferences of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, these confer conferences happen every six months, and they're, they're seen as very important to, 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 to Mormons, and so as soon as recording equipment was available in Utah, they've been recorded. Um, ever since 19, or all the conferences since 1971 are available for download on LDS.org. Uh, as a linguistic corpus, this is great because it has data from over 400 speakers and has between five and 600 hours of, of uh, speech. It's also great for real-time studies because many of the highest leaders speak at these conferences consistently for many decades. 
Um, and as far as I know, five have been, have been speaking for over four, 40 years, which is pretty cool. The speaker that I, I chose for, for this research is named Tom Perry. And he's known among Mormons informally for, for the way that he talks. And it's because of his cord card mer merger. As a brief sketch, he was born in 1922 in northern Utah. And if you recall, in, uh, the cord card mer merger was complete in Salt Lake in the 1930s. So we would expect him to have this, this feature. Um, he began full-time church service as a church le leader at the age of 52. And here's a picture of what he looked like then. And here, and I don't have the sound hooked up, but uh, I have some sound here that you may hear. And here's what he looked, looked like in earlier this year. Um, uh, sorry, more recently because he passed away earlier this year. And I have a, a sample, but again, I forgot to hook up the sound. Um, so Tom Perry spoke 84 times in, at these conferences. And so these files were downloaded. It's about 21 hours of speech. Uh, they were processed through a force alignment software uh, called Darla, which uses FAVE, which I believe is available through the UPenn Linguistics Lab. Um, I collected data on over 100, or nearly 100,000 vowels, um, and that's not, a, not including diphthongs um, or un unstressed syllables. Uh, force alignment software is great, but there's still a lot that needs to be done by hand. And so I, I isolated words that were potentially involved in the cord card merger, and that I define that as any vowel that had O or A ah followed by an R. And I have about 1,300 tokens of those so far. I haven't done, I haven't finished going through all this data. And then F1, 2, and 3 measurements were taken at the midpoint of the vowel. Each of these 1,300 words were classified into one of three classes, OR, open OR, or AR. Um, I wanted to get a historical uh, classification, so I went to a pronunciation dictionary from the early 18 hundreds, and the pronunciation guide for each word um, retains the th this three-way distinction. And so each of those 1,300 words were cla classified into one of those three classes. And that's, um, and I excluded words um, with open syllables because that sort of tends to change the vowels. And I ex excluded words with variable pronunciation, such as R towards your. This data that was then processed in R and uh, using sort of the fu functions you see there. And I also use a st statistical software called Jump, which isn't really used very much in linguistics. It's more of a statistical thing, but I'll show you soon why we need to use Jump more because it's pretty fantastic. Um, I excluded outliers, I should mention this, um, which I defined as any point that was greater than three standard deviations um, from the, the mean F1 or F2 for that vowel per decade. Good luck following that. Um, <laughs> so the results. I wanted to do some statistical tests, and so I did. I used what's called a MANOVA test. This test is appropriate for data that has multiple continuous de dependent variables. In this case, the F1 and 2, or F1, 2, and 3 values. Um, and that's predicted by one or more categorical variables. In this case, one of the three vowel classes. My first test was I wanted to see whether open OR was the same as AR in the 1970s. Basically, I wanted to see if he started off with a cord card merger. And normally you want small p-values, but in this case, I want a large p-value to show that there's no statistical uh, difference between these two classes. However, I ended up getting a very small p-value, which is a little bit disheartening. My next test that I did was to see whether open OR was the same as OR in 2010, or rather the the last few, few years of his, his life. I wanted to see if he, he died with a horse-horse merger. Again, I wanted a large p-value, and again, I got a very small p-value, which was also a little bit disheartening. But as Dr. Renwick, Renwick recently reminded me, p-values can be misleading with large data sets. Um, if you have enough data, you can get statistical significance for anything. And so um, I'm not going to trust these quite yet because I do have a fairly large data set. And so we're going to go to more visual tests. And so here I'm going to take you over to jump. Um, and I hope this works. OK. Here's what's called a bubble plot. So here you can see the vowel space of Tom Perry's vowels in 1973. And it the location of vowel is appropriate for F1 and F2. The size of each bubble corresponds to how much data or how, how many tokens of that vowel I had. Now, where's the mouse? Watch what happens when I press play. This may be the coolest <laughs> visualization of language change across time that I've ever seen. 
Um, <laughs> certainly the most, the, the coolest one I've ever done. <laughs> it's good spilling. Let that, let that finish. So what this shows is that generally all the vowels raised across time. And that to me was, was pretty cool. I, I, I thought I found something really neat with this. It turns out uh, the vocal tract lengthens as a person ages. And so that has the effect of lowering all the vowel formats, which has the effect of raising all the vowels. And so the fact that all the, the, the vowels here, especially the low ones raised, um, well, wasn't actually very significant. So I wanted to, to show that to sh because I'm going to show some other plots and you'll see sort of the vowels raising in time and I'll, I want to sort of emphasize that that's not the important part gonna, and so try to ignore that. The next plots that I'll be showing you are focused just on the lower back portion of the vowel space and just lo looking at the vowels followed by R. So here you can see the vowel space in the 1970s and here the green vowel is the OR, that's the high, highest one, and the red vowel is, the a, is AR, which is the low one. The variable one, the, the blue open OR, or here it's represented as OHR, um, is the one that, that sort of supposedly goes between the two. Now, to me it looks like the AR vowel class is almost completely surrounded by the, the, the uh, blue open OR, uh, which, which, which suggests that they're, they're, he started off with a chord card merger, which, which is what I expected. Now, watch what happens when I step through one decade at a time. Of course, you see all the vowels raising, but what, what you see by the end is that the blue vowel class overlaps quite a bit more with the green one than it does with the red one, which suggests that, that there's more of a horse-horse merger than a chord card merger. So that was the visual, visualization in, in jump. Uh, excuse me, in R. Now we're going to go back to jump and look at a 3D scatter plot and take into account the third formant value. So here is the same data in the 1970s, um, but with the added dimension of the F3 as a depth dimension. This is cool because you can spin it and view it from different angles and things like this. Um, so again, the, the, the green vowel space here almost completely surrounds the red space. And so that to me suggests that he started off with a chord card merger. Now if we go down to the 2010s, here we see that the blue vowel space overlaps quite a bit more with the green one, or rather the green one um, overlaps more with the blue than it does with the red. And I feel like this angle right here sort of shows that the best. Learn to use jump everybody, it's fantastic. <laughs> um, so uh, in the scatter plot it shows that he was closer to a chord card merge in the 1970s than he was uh, today, and by the time he died, he had something closer to a horse-horse mer merger. So in conclusion, um, as I said a, a few times already, in the 1970s, he, he started off with something closer to a chord card mer merger, and by the time he, he, he died, he had something closer to a horse-horse merger. It's not a complete shift. Uh, it's not as clean of a, uh, of a, a change as I would have liked it to have been, but it, it's, it's still... I believe it to still be a significant change. Um, someone was once asked me recently, well, what did he, he change into? What, what did he, he uh, what was his sort of goal? And I would say that similar to the Queen of England and the other um, studies that, that were done, his language change sort of goes in the same direction as the language change in the community around him. And so in conclusion, uh, my, I think the take home message for this is that change is faster than the apparent time hypothesis would, would, would lead us to believe. If a sociolinguist wanted to look at um, language in, in Utah in the 1930s and interviewed Tom Perry when he was in his 90s, the researcher would have to conclude that there wasn't a chord card mer merger because that, the, the speaker didn't have it, when in fact he, he did have the chord card merger. And so, because language happens within the, the individual over the course of, of, of their lifetime, it kind of masks the, um, some of this, this uh, stuff that we're trying to find with the apparent time hi 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 hypothesis. There are some references if you want them, and thank you. Yes? But four doesn't really get realized as 
as dinner. It doesn't really get realized as poor um, too often. It was a paper that will tell you when it gets realized as poor. And you can send it to you if you want. But um, I would say that it isn't realized as poor. Right. Thanks. Um, I did look at it at that word in particular, and sometimes it was, it, or rather, I only kept the ones that were, were stressed, and so that were yeah. uh, supposedly realized with the, the full four, and I didn't really look at it too closely to, to see if there were anything excluded. But again, I, I, I excluded outliers that were really deviant from, from that, so hopefully I got that taken care of. But yes, thank you. Yeah. Could you go back to slide, uh, I think 17, or no, no, the R visualization. Uh, let's see, where's the mouse? Where's the mouse? 17. Or the visualization in R, yeah, that one. So, could, um, I can't quite remember where the vowel labels on the words came from. Did they come from the dictionary, or did Darla put them in for you? Um, they came from the dictionary. Okay. Okay, so, all right, so these are, the, the, the color is given by the, the vowel that the dictionary says should be there. Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Great graphics. Thanks. <laughs> so cool. But yeah. Thanks for showing um, you know, that I should learn stuff that I, I don't want to spend time learning this. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another way, so this is really cool because you're doing this acoustically. Have you gone through and done an impressionistic listening to selected sets of all of these categories from the 70s and then from, say, the, the 10s? So, Do you what, see what I'm, is what I'm asking clear? Right. Um, so when I transcribed uh, some of the, this stuff when I was going and tr trying to find these tokens, there were, I guess I listened to it, but I didn't really pay attention to what I was, I was listening to. Uh, there is another re researcher, uh, David Bowie, who, yeah, his name's close, but um, who looked at this, this, get, this same speaker with the chord card merger, and he did more of an impressionistic, he had people judge whether it sounded more like or are. Uh, that's what I was going to suggest, like that. That, that might also be an additional point that, that I presumably would move in your favor, going in yeah. favor of strain and strengthen your argument. Uh, since you know it does go against one of the, the assumptions of sociolinguistics, and if you're going to, although it's a flawed assumption and clearly a flawed assumption, I and mean, based on most people's experience, own experience, you know that you will adjust how you speak given different environments. Why wouldn't you think that happens over time? Uh, so it, it's really nice. It would be nice to strengthen your own argument either by importing that guy's uh, uh, arguments or doing some of that yourself. Yeah, that's true. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm familiar with both these merges, but not in the context of uh, of Utah. So maybe yeah, as a little, little you might know, hear after a little bit. Sure. Uh, so is this uh, tend to be a you know so people those people who have the uh, four part merges that a merger to closer to or or merge closer to R? It's co closer to R. Okay, so you have you have R and then uh, and then the. Uh, the horse the horse right. Right. So I would pronounce it the horse horse merger and cord card merger. He would pronounce it the horse horse merger and the card card merger. Okay. Uh, and then also, it's, it's, so that's where I ask my second question, which is that this is a road right? This is a what? Sorry. The road dialect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think there are more questions. I don't mean that. No, it's fine. So did you look at the extent to which um, the following? Coda constant following the, the root affects the, the formant values of the, the measurements that we make? No. Um, I trusted the forced alignment to segment the vowel, uh, or rather segment the R uh, and the vowel. I don't know what their algorithm is to, to, to find that segmentation. The output does include um, formant measurements at various parts, or like the 20%, 35 at, um, into the vowel, and so I haven't looked at the tra trajectory yet. But does it tell you what the adjacent segments are? Yes. So if you sorted the coda, the, the data by the, the something general, like place of articulation of the following coda constant, 
if there is one. Mm -hmm. right? You would probably still get messy, somewhat overlapping messy data, but it might separate out a little bit more. Um, where if you have like all the, all the, the cases where it's followed by a bilabial, uh, I don't even know if this is going to happen. I haven't thought about it uh, through enough. But versus a, a coronal versus a, a velar or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, and that might might be something that again can make the effect you're talking about slightly clearer visually. Yeah. Maybe or maybe not. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, 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 I was also kind of it, it crossed my mind at the beginning talking about this product back up. Um, but actually, now looking at this, um, the word Lord in particular is all over the place. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Well, yeah, springing off of that, um, you know, Lord being a great example for his speeches, I'm sure he used a lot. But uh, frequency effects of the lexical items that are used, um, you can look at the variation of those vowels because highly frequent vowels are going to or word items, I mean, are going to have some differences in their vowels, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, so that may be, you know a statistical way to test that, Joey. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was one, one word. Uh, you mentioned frequency. He's, he, he said the word uh, farfetcher, which I thought was the most hilarious uh, word I've heard. Um, I, I, I think it's somewhere on this graph, but anyway. So yes, frequency may, may have an effect, but that one-off farfetcher word may Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's another channel, you know, to explore. Yeah. Yeah. You said that you would noted to have distinctive speech before you even did it. You know. Right. Um, was it just the, the chord card, seeming chord card word? Um, he has some other features. Um, for example, uh, the word me measure, like if you want to measure something, it's measure. Um, and I, I want to say there are some uh, other things too, but it's. Uh, yeah, he's 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 known for having a distinctive speech, and anyway, so yeah, yeah. That just brings up a question: Was he a native Utahan? Yes, he was born in northern Utah, okay. and I believe spent most of his life in Utah. Certainly, the forty years that, that this study shows were all spent in Utah. Very cool. Yeah. Is there anyone that you could like compare him to? Then, I mean, is there anybody like about the same? Yes. As I showed before, there are five speakers that have been speaking at these conferences for 40 years. I can't think of who the other ones are right now, but I believe they're all from Utah as well. I don't know why they don't have the court card merger. Maybe they're, they're from southern Utah or, or something. But yeah, that's a good idea. It'd be interesting too to like watch the two uh, things going side by side and uh, seeing if they are moving in the same direction at the same time. That's true. That'd be great. And just touching on that again, uh, it, where his parents were from, or where the, those various sets of people, you know, that four or five set, of, mm -hmm. four, set of four or five people, where their families were from, because that might have influenced their early acquisition. Right. So, right. Very cool stuff. Thanks. How reliable are the recordings? Um, <coughs> they're pretty good. Um, my my one concern is that there is a little bit of sort of reverb, some echo, because he's speaking in a huge uh, auditorium. Um, but I listened to the ones in the 70s, and they're they're not bad at all. And the ones uh, most recently are certainly very good. Yeah. And I would have played them for you, but I forgot to set up the sound. So sorry. Thank you very much.
that you got. And if you have questions, um, my phone number and Trevor's phone number and Doug's phone number is on.